So hi everyone, thank you for joining me today. Um, I'm Emma Sims, I'm an energy healer if I haven't met many of you yet before. Um, and I've come up with this idea to do Diary of a Healer, which is something that I've been sort of working towards for the last few years because my own journey, I've met so many amazing people. Um, and I wanted to just bring that to you today to share with you some of the people that I've met. So today I'm joined by Tree Carl, who is an amazing inspiration. She's a tarot reader, um, a death dollar. She's, um, a, a, well, a writer of, an author of loads of different books, all to do with lucid dreaming. And she's just a, an amazing inspiration. Um, and I know that, you know, I think in our own journeys, we've all been on this path where we reach a point in our lives where we want to just make a change um, and do something totally different. So, you know, the Diary of a Healer is bringing that to light and showcasing some of these amazing people that have had these journeys themselves and actually changed their career and done this as a profession. Um, I know myself, my journey, I was a photographic producer many years ago and now I'm an energy healer, crystal healer, my path completely changed. And it was just such an inspiring moment for me to know that I could actually be able to help so many people. So yeah, I just really am grateful for you all to join this live today. And we'll be joined very shortly by Tree, who will talk you through her own journey. Um, and then we'll share some healing with you to end. So if there's any questions that you want to ask along the way, please do. Um, and just, you know, make sure that you're... Oh, sorry, one second, I'm just seeing if Tree's there. Yeah, so ask, feel free to ask some questions along the way. Um, anything that you want to find more out about Tree or myself. Hi Claire, great to have you here. Hi Amber. Oh, it's great to see you, great to see so many of you. Thank you so much for joining. So, yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, the Diary of a Healer is something that we all just need to be aware that there's so many um, different lines of work out there at the moment for people to actually be inspired by and just to meet different people and also to embrace the alternative therapies, to embrace the healing, to embrace the tarot reading um, and to embrace different aspects so that, you know, it widens everything so much more to us now that we're looking for alternative ways to actually help us heal, help us feel more positive in our bodies, helping us to feel more focused, helping us to feel a lot better as a human being and interact more with each other on a positive level. I'm just seeing now. I'm just gonna see if I can tree in to join. Let's just see. Yep. Okay, so it should. Ah, Hi. yeah. Hey, Tree. How's it going? Yeah, really good. Thanks. Good to see you. Great to see you. Let me turn my volume up there. Yeah. Hi, hey, how are you good. Going? There we go, yeah. So I've just introduced you, Tree, and I've spoken a little bit about um, myself as well and the whole basis of the Diary of a Healer and exposing just women on their own journeys and why they've you know, ended up doing what they do and how they've made amazing careers out of that as well, which is something that you've done. Yeah, you know, it's one, one of those things I, I didn't really expect, you know, like I, I, I grew up, when I was a kid, like not knowing what I wanted to be when I grew up. And, and part of that too was, um, you know, not really liking the pressure of that. Yeah. <laughs> I remember as a little kid, um, you know, in school, they'd always, you know, have to do these like career tests and what are you going to be when you grow up? And I yeah. found it really stressful. And I, you know, I just kept thinking like, why do I have to be anything when I grow up? Why can't I, you know, it just felt really, um, daunting and but I found myself in a, a wide variety of, of um, work in terms of career I predominantly worked in the music and film world for a very long time 
um, up until the age of 40 when everything came to a peak. And all of a sudden I found myself moving into working uh, in this, this healing path. Uh, and it effectively was something that I was doing on my own as, a, you know, privately as a private practice, always mm -hmm. identifying as a witch and, you know, kept that really neatly tucked away in the broom closet and you didn't really want to tell people that sort of thing. People get really yeah. put off by that word or even just, you know, sharing anything that's slightly mystical or exceptional experiences of consciousness that aren't really part of our, you know, current reductive uh, mentalities here. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, so, it's so weird, isn't it? Because I think now it's almost like there's a movement I think now we've been through COVID, I don't know about you, but I think people are so much more open to wanting to try alternative ways of helping themselves, you know, and actually reconnecting with their, with their spirit, with their own soul. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's like, there's nothing supernatural about this process. It's natural. Yeah. And it is just innately part of being a human being. And a, I really believe that a big part of that is is connecting to not only our inner worlds but our place in nature too so the natural world worlds as well and you know the more we connect with nature and the the rhythms and the process of nature the more we we feel it still and connected to ourselves we, we're just you know innately symbiotically connected to the planet into nature yeah. and I think we've lost that connection as we've become no, more of an industrial you know uh, materialistic western society um, so a part of that is getting back to a lot of that too yeah just very simple truths really and I think I think as well it's like you know with your tarot reading that you do it's giving people like for, for me I think tarot is amazing because it's something that I go to when I'm sometimes at a crossroads but also when I want a bit of direction and I don't know whether you've found that more now where people are looking to maybe change their path you know and they're looking for the tarot reading to give them that you know that direction and that help yeah. and that guidance. I, I really think that I think you know people have a long history of, of turning to divination and and to you know wise women and seers for direction I mean I guess which is our like an ancient form of uh... oh sorry I lost you there that's all right um, so it, it does feel that people are more and more looking for this sort of connection and I think it's because we live in a, an age where like I said, we've become disconnected. We are yeah. technologically more connected than ever yeah. when it comes to, you know, the internet and social media. But within the context of that over, you know, technical, you know, uh, connection, we're very alienated in the process. Uh, levels of anxiety within society are really high. Feelings of alienation and isolation and depression are really high. And this is just the result of living in a, you know, an over industrialized capital capitalist system, really, where okay. people are just completely um, at the mercy of their work, their jobs, the rhythm of yeah. the industrial complex. And you see this when people stopped during the pandemic, when people had to go back home and have the stillness. Everyone, not everyone, but a lot of people were mentioning wow, I'm coming back to myself, like, yeah. I'm finally getting a good night's sleep. I feel like I want to connect to things that are deeper because we've stopped. We stopped working that manic cycle that we're all, kind of, you know, stuck into. And sometimes it takes the stepping away and the pause in order to realize what, you've, what you're missing and what you're lacking. So I think I the pandemic has really highlighted this and a lot of people are going, oh, I, I really want to, to connect or get some guidance or yes. seek yeah. this out. And I think that's why tarot has made this um, interesting, you know, resurgence. Like it's always been there, but I think people are kind of like, oh, yeah. <laughs> I want some, go some direction here. I think this can help. Yes. I think as well, I mean, it's like, so I, I went to Tree's house a while ago and I had my tarot reading there, which is, I mean, 
you know what that house I, it just stays in my memory so much because it's such a powerful place and the energy you know like when you walk into a room and you can almost feel the energies of people walking mm. around you the energy in that space is amazing um and just having yeah having my cards read it just kind of reaffirmed a lot for me because i mean obviously my path has completely changed i was working as a photographic producer for many years and it was almost like this sort of spiritual awakening moment that people talk about and even though i've been spiritually connected i've always had that feeling of connecting with energy when that happens and that transition takes place you you know it's so powerful you can't stop that path can you you just have to keep on going but i think when that seed of doubt starts sowing in and going mm, you know can i actually do this that's why you know that's why i came to you for the reading because it was just yeah it was brilliant absolutely brilliant Oh, well, I'm really pleased that that was helpful for you. It was nice to have you over in my house and mm. uh, wonderful. And yeah, it can feel very daunting and uh, changing and moving into a different path. But I think once you do it, you, you realize that, you know, perhaps you've always been pulled or called into that direction. And, and certainly I felt that for myself, um, you know, we getting back to what we were saying about like, what are you going to be when you grow up? And yeah. Just, you know, just feeling like, oh, why do I have to have that pressure? Um, I had like a wide variety of synchronistic and I suppose quite powerful experiences since a young age that pulled me into the direction that I'm in now. And it, it mm. took like, you know, my entire life to the age of 40 to really, to really step into that. So part of that was like the long view. Uh, and the evolution of my experiences that accumulated into the moment where I felt like, whoa, I'm, I'm meant to be working, you know, in, in these realms and stepping out. And when I say working and stepping into these realms, I'm talking about uh, dreams, death and divination, yeah. the, these three areas of uh, support that I've, I've moved into for people. Um, and I felt like, you know, looking back in retrospect for my whole life, that, you know, my life, there, I was being prepared for this, like, you know, who's preparing me for this? I don't know. Is it the universe? I don't know. Is it myself? Perhaps it is. I don't know. Yeah, but, yeah. but there's been too many interesting, you know, co coincidences that have happened throughout my life that, you know, brought me into, you know, okay, step out and help others. And it was, a, it was an interesting process, you know, like, uh, I think one of my first experiences were was when I was four years old when I had a near-death experience and that you know I'm able to look back and go that's when it all started really <laughs> yeah exactly that's that moment isn't it you can kind of you remember it because it's so yeah it's so vivid yeah it's vivid and it's uh transformative it it shifts you into um it's almost like um this this bigger perspective of of, of existential questioning and what is it all about but also you know looking at death in the face too and coming out the other end of that really changes you as a person and there's a sense of almost like a, a dissolving of your of your identity of your ego and even though I was four years old and I probably didn't have much of one at that time because I only had four years under my belt there was it was enough for me to understand the power of nature understand that you know these these greater, you know, realities like, mm -hmm. hey, we're gonna die, you know, and you can either fight it or you can uh, just realize that it's a, it's part of this whole cycle that we're in. And I think just experiencing that as, as a four year old was enough to to start me on my my journey uh, around working with death and dying and and being of of support for people. Um, mm -hmm. It just went from strength to strength, uh, you know, after that experience. Uh, it so was, did you was... actually see, you know, could you, re can you actually remember everything that happened to you as you were, like, I don't know, because they talk about going down a tunnel, don't they, and this white light, and I mean, what happened? Yeah, what so it, it really does, you never forget these things because no. death and an experience close to death on the, on the edge of it, like that really pulls you into the present moment. There's no way you could be like, daydreaming or thinking about, oh, what am I going to have for dinner? Or what am I going to do tomorrow? It's like, eh, you're in, you know, 
it's now, this is it, right? And also, of course, you know, with the threat of death, <laughs> you, you, your whole being and your body is in an absolute state of, I want to survive. Yeah, and absolutely. Because you were in water, weren't you? Were you at the beach? Yeah, I was at the beach. So I was a, you know, four-year-old just uh, in South Carolina at the beach yeah. on the sand collecting shells, just daydreaming. And a sneaker wave came out of nowhere. So the, you know, the Atlantic is, is pretty, it's a pretty powerful body of water. Mm -hmm. And the sneaker wave just came out of nowhere. And the first thing I remember was like the, the sand below my feet starting to dissolve like quicksand. So the, oh, you know, so it started off like that mm -hmm. where this uh, incredible, um, you know, the water was like literally under the sand and it started to dissolve. So my, my, my feet started to sink into the sand and then, and then the wave came in. And it pulled me out so powerful. Uh, as it was pulling me out, I was like grasping at the poles of the docks, the wooden docks, and yeah. trying to grab hold of them. And they were covered in barnacles and they were just shredding and ripping my hands. And, and I was just, the power of the wave was just intense. And so my life like flat, literally flashed before my oh, eyes. My and, and as I was getting pulled out like in this big washing machine, vibe you know and having this real sense of like this is it I'm going I'm, yeah. I'm gonna die and um I'm gonna be I'm you know uh, my family flashed before my eyes my my parents my you know my siblings and I thought I had I felt great sadness for them mm -hmm. I felt their grief of not being able to ever find my body like it was this whole mm -hmm. understanding that yeah they're never gonna find like that I'm gone I'm yeah. That's it. And, and then, then this just sort of like this acceptance of like, you, you know, uh, in peace, it was like an intense feeling of, you know, dissolving of all things, uh, but a whole plethora of emotions and layers of emotions in a very mm -hmm. split second, uh, you know, time frame. Um, and then just this intense uh, dissolving into everything. Uh, and an acceptance of it, and a peace and a calm of it all. Uh, yeah, so I guess it's almost like a surrendering, you know? Because oh yeah, you do. You know, it's like you're you're there in it, aren't you? Yeah, you just go. Oh, well, that's it. So yeah, you know, that's it. And then There's so someone's saying in the chat that they've clinically died three times. Wow, oh, that's gosh. absolutely intense. Yeah. Yeah. So you probably, if your consciousness is. Uh, is aware that there, uh, Sarah, within those moments, you can, you know, the, the experience can be very transformative. And yeah. um, luckily, you know, we, hey, we both survived these things. And my dad bas basically rescued me because he had, he had seen from the shore that there was, you know, that th this wave came in. And so he came out and rescued me and he pulled me to safety. And and then when he pulled me onto the beach, he, he took a photo of me. He said, can you stand still? I'm going to take a photo. And I never understood at the time. I was absolutely in shock. And then just sort of like, is he taking the photo to cheer me up? I just couldn't understand. It was years later when I was a teenager, I asked him, why did you take this photo? We still have the photo. I have it right there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll actually, I'll get it. And so Sarah's off. saying that she remembers she remembers everything. So that's that's quite something, isn't it? To I mean, I guess it's so vivid that it just stays with you. Oh wow, look, yeah. So my dad oh, took God. this photo because he said, you know, your eyes looked they they were really they looked so different and they changed. And I just wanted to also take the photo because it, it was, you know a reminder mm. of of being rescued and that you're alive. And so my oh, eyes. Amazing. Uh, had seen death yes. and my father just really wanted to capture that but very much like Sarah saying I left with with a powerful gifts and intuition that's, and yeah this that's is just what I'm thinking does that does that ignite something in you because I mean obviously for you working with death now because you've seen it that's kind of eliminated the fear of it right so yeah you're probably much more able to be side by side with someone who is reaching that point because you've almost experienced that yourself 
Yes, it's incredible. And your sensitivities become very heightened and your intuition become very heightened. And, and also because you had one foot on the other side that way in that very liminal threshold, it stays with you. And so I found that as I grew older, um, you know, when I became a teenager, it was like I had, was having a lot of experiences with death. Um, I was I also at that time just saying to my mom and my mom and granny would always go to funerals and always support people, uh, you know, the friends and family when there was death. And I was, you know, like 15 and 16 to 18 saying, oh, can I come to the funeral? Like I wanted to be around it and I wanted to be around wakes and around okay. the grieving process. So I felt very comfortable around that. I wanted to be around like I, not because I was morbid or a goth or something like that. No, I, no, but yeah, probably just I just more. felt like I it was my place to be there. Yeah. And so I was with my granny and my mom and I was like, you know, stepping into that role as a teenager. And I remember my best friend at the time too, her father was dying of cancer and he for many years like slowly at home and I was of great support to her. And oh, it just felt like I always was around it and I was always yeah. holding space and helping. And, um, and then around that time, all these unusual circumstances of synchronicity started happening where out in public, I would be at the right place when someone was in, a, in a, uh, an accident or falling over or having a heart attack or having a seizure. And these things were happening like about three to four times a year. Like so much so that it became a long running sort of joke with friends. Yeah, like, that's like your call of duty. Yeah. Like whenever you're around, someone's falling over and, you know, trapped under a bus or hit off their motorcycle or having a seizure. And like, I mean, so, many, so much so, it was so uncanny that yeah. it, it, you couldn't ignore that this was like. No, it's all signs, like, isn't it? It's like in your face then. It's like you, you've got to do something with it. Amazing. I always jump to the rescue, you know. And I, I never felt like a paramedic or anything, but I always was like super calm in the midst of people freaking out, people bleeding, people with broken collarbones and, and uh, you know, there just, just holding space. And so this accumulated all through my life until I was, you know, about 40 when – you know, I had a man die in my arms and it was on, in public and it was just, it was just Was intense. it someone you knew or someone? No, you strangers. This is happening with strangers. So like wow. really like, wow. you know, becoming almost like this is really bizarre how much yeah. this happens. And, uh, and I was, I held space for this man and we were all trying to save his life with CPR. And of course, the paramedics were too late and I experienced his death and he, he was see, he was seeing something. His eyes were fixed wide open, looking up at the sky. It was like right in the middle of London on the street. Yeah. And I just was holding his hand saying, you're not alone. You're not alone. Everything you, you're going to, it's going to be, you're going to, people are coming. It's going to be okay. And, you know, words of just soothing him as we were doing CPR on him mm -hmm. and, it, their tears were just streaming from his face. His eyes were transfixed upwards. And I just kept thinking, he's seeing something here. And um, and then his last breath, he it just, it just felt, it felt him transist. And so it was at that point where I was like, this is happening too much for yeah, me absolutely. to ignore. So I'm going to consult my dreams and just ask my dreams, why is this you know, happening. And I got the answer as I was waking up uh, with a quick succession of the connect the dots situation where I was seeing visions of every time I've held space for people from the time I was a young person to then. And it was like, duh, come on, slap in the face. This is what you, you're meant to, you're meant to be stepping into this role. Mm -hmm. Like you are falling into place here and you need to now really come out with this and I was just woke up and said to my partner, is, is this some kind of job? Like, I don't know of any job like that. I'm not yeah. a nurse. I'm not a paramedic. I'm not dr drawn to the, the med medical thing. And uh, so I just, I just thought about it. I was like, well, I'm offering emotional support. I'm there as an energetic presence. And so I'm going to do a Google search on that. So I looked yeah. up 
emotional support at death. That was all I could imagine that what I was doing. And I saw the death doula page come up, which was for training with living well, dying well, Crossfields Institute. And I looked at the page and I was like, that's it. That's what I'm doing. I'm a death doula. Yeah. That's I didn't know there was a word for it. And, uh, so I got, I, you know, enrolled to the training and, you know, spent, you know, three years doing the training and, uh, came out as a certified death doula. Now, a doula is from the Greek word, a uh, woman who serves. Yeah. So I'm, effectively a, a woman who serves around the time of death you have birth doulas who are women who serve at the time of birth so i'm yeah. on the other end <laughs> it's amazing isn't it because i've done i've done healing on people when they're about to pass through but it's um yeah i mean do you are you with them the whole time then well just like birth you never know when it's going to come true and so as a birth doula, you know you try to you know facilitate as much as you can uh sometimes mm -hmm. you never know when it's going to come with the death doula stuff i come in at various varying points on depending on what the person or the family want so i've done okay. everything from uh deathbed vigiling to um you know uh just having one off session with a person who's been diagnosed with terminal cancer mm -hmm. and and just talking through it so it can be a long process. It could be a one-off session. It could be a three-day process. It could be a remote process too. I've helped people remotely. Like in Italy, you know, while I'm here in the UK, uh, you know, FaceTiming and holding mm -hmm. space, oh, you know, at a distance. Wow. Wow. And so it's a, a wide variety of things. Um, but effectively, it's not even just for the person who's dying. It's also the family too. So I support a lot of family members who were feeling, you know, the intensity of their loved one on their deathbed or dying and mm -hmm. been able to hold space for them to help them through the grief and the stress and the dying process of their loved ones. So it takes, a, there's a lot of different layers, you know, that can be psychological support, emotional support, it can have spiritual support depending on where yeah, the person's absolutely. ontological views are. It yeah. can be practical stuff too. Just mm -hmm. signposting, you know, saying, I know a good Reiki healer who could help, or I, yeah. I can help you with uh, the certificates, the death certificates, yes. you know, like all the paper, the paperwork uh, uh, or organizing memorials or funerals. I'm also an ordained minister. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I saw that. That's amazing. Yeah. Gosh. But I'm not like a minister. I'm, a, you know, I'm a yeah. high priestess. I'm a high priestess, yeah. but I'm, I'm ordained yeah. to, you know, to, yeah. to be there to conduct a funeral or a memorial, um, you know, and to hold space for that too. So even all the practical stuff as well. Um, but yeah, so that's that's how I became. That's how I grew up, and I found out what I was Based supposed with to death. do. Yeah. Yeah. And something magical happens at the age of 40. 40 is a very powerful time on the True. magical. This is a shifting time. And for women, they really move into their cronehood. So this is as a woman, this is when you start moving into your wise woman years. Mm -hmm. And I'm turning 49 next week. Mm -hmm. Ah! <laughs> wow. And as I moved through my 40s, you know, going through perimenopause and now menopause and all oh, the God, shifts you're looking shifts forward to that. biology, oh, yeah. it can be a very empowering time, though, if you if, if you connect to it from the point of view that you're stepping into your wisdom and these changes yes. are powerful, you can really it can really increase your you know everything that you're doing as a healer. It's very important. Um, in fact, history saw it that way too and, and, and punished us women for that. If you look back at the early modern period of the witch trials, 80% of the witches who were tortured and murdered were women over 40. So that's saying why a lot. Is that? Yeah, why is that though? Why did that happen? Because why most women over 40 are are the crones, are the yeah. wise women, and they, they were a threat. Because uh, they hold too much knowledge. 
Mm. Yeah, and at that time, they were a threat to the, you know, the religious establishment. So a lot of people would go to the, the wise women for their their healing. They would go to wise women for knowledge with herbs. And, and you know, so it was, it was just a, you know, part of life back then. But yeah, yeah. like Sarah, like you said, there, a lot of hysteria was going on at the time. And they saw, you know, especially women, older women as a threat. So we still have that hangover even now where people look at women who are menopausal and go, oh, she's such a hag or she's a bitch. You know? <laughs> yeah, definitely. It's still a real stigma to that, isn't there? So, um, so also treat with your lucid dreaming. I mean, that's something that I've read so much on myself over the years. And um, so I'm going to talk to you about a dream that I've had. And I don't know your take on this, but this is really something that um, has always, always stuck with me. So my gra I was living out in Italy at the time and I'd left, my, I'd left my family and everything. It was a really total new experience for me. I was studying art and, um, you know, said goodbye to my granddad. And I knew, you know, when you just have that deep inner knowing feeling that your grandparents are not going to live forever, but, you know, my granddad was well. It wasn't a problem at all. One night went to sleep and um, my nana, who's, who had passed away years, many years before, came and she sat on the end of my bed. And she was talking to me and she was saying, now I had not dreamt of my Nana before. She just, you know, appeared in my dream and it was so powerful. She was just talking to me and saying, I'm waiting for your granddad. He's really ill. Um, and I was thinking, well, and I was talking to her, I was saying, but he's not ill. He's absolutely fine. And yes, yeah, she was saying, no, I'm waiting for him. He'll be here soon because I know he's, I know he's starting his journey now. Anyway, so I'd spoke to my mum the next day and I said to her, mum, I had this really vivid dream. Nana came to see me. Um, and you know, she said that, and she said, yeah, granddad's ill in hospital. He's really, really ill, but I think he's holding out until you come back home. So I came back, flew back, saw him. And I didn't tell him about what had happened, but you know, and he passed away. So years later, I spoke to my cousin about this because my cousin and I, I don't know, we kind of both think in a very similar way. And when her mum uh, sadly passed away a few years ago, she came to me as well, not in a dream, but just when I was out in the garden and I spoke to her about you know people coming to me in dreams people see, I see things and I experience things and she had that exact same dream she had the same dream when my nana had come and sat on the end of her bed and told her that granddad was dying so I mean you know obviously you're an expert in all of this but um is that because you know, at the time you know when you start to think to yourself was that real was that you know, what is that crossover point? And can you start communicating with people that have passed to the other side like that? If I wanted to reconnect with my Nana. Yes, absolutely. And what you're describing is a really amazing phenomenon of, of shared and mutual dreaming experiences, especially around death. And this is a very... Um, common experience, exceptional experience of human um, consciousness, and yet it's very understudied. Now there's some really great, um, there's a really great book called The Art of Dreaming by, by Dr. Peter Fenwick. And okay. he outlines a lot of this phenomenon in this book, where people have these experiences, like you said, of uh, vis visitations and family members having uh, a sense of the death as it, the person's dying or before the person's dying and, uh, and these shared experiences with other family members. And it just goes to show just how much we don't know about the human experience and how, uh, how uniquely uh, intertwined we are when it comes to the, the collective. And often in families, this can happen because of the probably maybe the close uh, bond emotional bonds that families have but this is a really uh, fascinating and exciting uh, experience of consciousness in and around the limbal times of death um, certainly it should be looked at more uh, certainly it should be discussed and discussed more and I've, I've had experiences like this as well and certainly as a death doula seen you know, the deathbed phenomenon yes. uh, that happens quite a bit, which happens when people are dying, especially in the 
in the actively um, active times of dying, the three days before death, um, you know, people having uh, ancestors come visit them in dreams or deathbed visitations where they have visions on the, you know, beside the bed or around the bed or the mm -hmm. energy shifts in the room or there's mist in the room or light. I mean, these things are, are, are well, you know, documented by yeah. people who work in hospices and family members and loved ones. So there's, you know, this is not, you know, it's a common knowledge, word of mouth yeah. knowledge. But of course, science doesn't really see this as important and is not going to really study this sort of thing. But it happens and, you know, it's happened for thousands of years and in all different types of belief systems. So this kind of um, experience can bring a lot of calm and closure mm -hmm. to the, the dying process for the dying person. It can bring peace and comfort to those who are left behind, like yourself and your family members who experience this, you know, yeah. this uh, sort of thing. And you hear these stories, right? Like my dad has had, has these stories with his own mother and uh, my yes. grandfather as well. And it is so amazing, amazing, right? When that happens, it's just such a beautiful, um, yeah, it's just a, such a beautiful experience, you know. Just it is beautiful, and, and, and it never leaves you. It's like one of those things that you know. I've, I've not seen my nana since. That's the only time that she's come to me in that dream. That's the only time. It's and it's, it's amazing. Mm. And if, it doesn't matter what your, you know, your cosmology is. You know, if, if you're, um, you know, a reductionist who is an atheist who believes like there's nothing more to this life than this, still an experience like that can hold great closure. Yes. It can bring great comfort so even if you don't believe in anything you know yeah. beyond this it can still bring healing so so welcome it or if you're a person who has more of a open view and you think that possibly consciousness survives the grave then it can also have its healing benefits as well so I always say to people like look it was an experience that you have don't try to overthink it maybe don't no. try to deny it just yeah. just just receive it for the healing that it brought you and the closure that it brought you so just allow the process it's mm. beautiful so everyone can have this experience and have something amazing uh you know bring some peace calm and some closure you know yeah absolutely and also like the message you know i mean like if i hadn't have had that experience i wouldn't have known that my granddad was ill because my mum had not told me so i guess she didn't want me to you know worry about it or fly back from leave italy but you know and i think there's quite a few people in the chat here that claire i know that you're having shared experiences and th you know so that i think this is this is the beauty of it all isn't it tree it's like the more you talk about these things the more you write about this the more you get it out there the more you know out you know it, it becomes so much more aware and in people's thinking that oh yeah you know i had that dream or i've I want to sort of maybe do more dream work, like your conscious dreamer book that you've brought out recently. Um, you know, I mean, that's something that you can do a lot of dream work, can't you, yourself? Yes, and you can do a lot of dream work in around this connection to those who are on the other side. So I'm going to speak broadly about this from, yeah. you know, from a cosmology of uh, consciousness survives death. Um, now, with this, obviously, you're embracing the concept that perhaps we can carry on in some kind of way after our biological death. So if that resonates with you, there are ways in which you can connect to your loved ones on the other side through dream work. And it just you know, takes a bit of intention. All you have to do is just go, I have the intention that I would like to connect with my grandmother, and I'm going to set that intention tonight before I go to sleep and do a meditation and some affirmations as you fall into sleep. Now, I think dream space is an amazing place in which you can connect because it is an in a liminal space. Yes. And it is a place, a crossover place, where it seems as though those who've passed over are able to meet you for a brief amount of time and then, you know, give a message or uh, have some connection before that, that they're untethered again. So that's liminal time of the dreams is very special. And also this time of year, the liminal time of Samhain, where we're in right now yeah. is very special. This whole week 
it had where we are on that liminal threshold so as a as a witch you you know you really work with this this time to honor uh your your loved ones yeah, your ancestors. ancestors yeah to make contact and if you're a, a medium as well or a psychopomp mm -hmm. so those are the realms of working in the realms of death this is a great time as well to help others connect to their loved ones who are on the other side mm -hmm. now a medium is a person who's a go between between the those who have died and those yeah. who are living yeah. and bringing the message so you're like a, a messenger a conduit uh, yes. for is a psychopomp is a pathfinder to the souls of the dead so a psychopomp helps those who are already on the other side who are a little bit lost and they need to try to <laughs> cross over and this could be you know people mm -hmm. who've died very abruptly died um inebriated or under the, in a coma and and might not realize that they're still in the liminal spaces mm -hmm. so a psychopomp is a you know a pathfinder uh, someone who helps them connect to the ancestors so this is a great time for psychopompery as well yeah amazing because um i with a lot of my healing work the spirits are coming through so much the light on you tree is amazing at the moment I don't know if you can see that it keeps on, <laughs> yeah, it's like, right. flashing and it's like yeah what's going on but um with the healing work the spirits come in and they give me messages and it's hard isn't it because sometimes they it's very brief um, and sometimes it's reoccurring. So if I work on a person, you know, a couple of times, three times, the messages are so clear that they want to communicate with this person. And it's so, it's hard sometimes because you see it and you know that they're there because you can feel it and you can see the message that they're giving. And it's amazing to then pass that on to that person. But there's that, there's that crossover point, isn't there, where you think, is that person going to think that I'm really totally bonkers? And you know, that what is she? Oh doing? yeah, I mean but, that's the first. That's the first thing you need to get over uh, when working, moving into working in in that sort of realm of yeah. mediumship and psychopomp work. You need to be like, you know, not afraid. To, like, okay, they they might think I'm bonkers. So it's almost like you have to put that aside and just yeah, go, exactly. I, I just don't care that they think I'm crazy. Like, I just need to. Yeah, to you just need it, to have this message. Yeah, just to do the work and knowing it, it's all for good intentions to help the person. And another thing to also navigate in in moving into these roles, if, in case any of you who are listening feel that you're being pulled into those zones of that role is to overcome fear as well. Because I think a lot of people navigate fear. They get really scared, you know, yeah. of the, of the connection and contact with um, those on the other side. And I think it's mostly because of, you know, we have horror films and we have, you know, we have all Yeah, exactly. Well, it's the unknown, isn't it? It's, you know, it's that knowing that you've just got to trust it. There's a great deal of trust as well in knowing that people do try and communicate with you and people want yeah. to, they want to, um let you know as well that you're still there well they're yeah. still there rather not you if you start to see it through the lens of like without fear it starts going from strength to strength now yeah. i'm not gonna say i'm not gonna like downplay this sometimes it's downright freaks you out right Definitely. like you, you know you just go whoa and i've had experiences where i've been doing psychopomp work uh, remotely through the dream state to help somebody and you know the the, the 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 deceased person is just like coming out 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 in the middle of the night in you know coming rushing at me waking me up um, like in a ghost like state and wow. uh, and you know waking me up and scaring me right and but you know I just laugh I go okay haha you got my attention yeah. Right. So you're here, you got my attention. So what, what can I, how can I help? So if you start to shift it through the, you know, the, through the lens of even when they scare you, it's, you know, just laugh, just go, okay, you got me. You yeah. got my attention. You just, you got to just see them as people Yeah. because exactly. that's all they are is people who are just, you know, and you, you get people that's sometimes how they communicate mm -hmm. in a trickster kind of way or in a way where they're, you know they they do this and it's only to get your attention so yeah exactly i like to, to say that because people feel like oh it's because it's evil or it's from you know and it's not it's just getting your attention 
Yeah. And th they certainly do get your attention sometimes. And then it shifts and changes. That's the thing. It always feels like it's, it's comforting. The energy always feels comforting. And it always feels that, yeah, they just, the messages are just so obscure that um, they make you want to pass that message on. They, they make sense to that person, you know? It's... Yes, absolutely. And I'm not gonna say all the experiences are like, they, they shock mm. you or scare you. I've only had like a handful of them that do do that. Yeah. For the most part, it's much like what you are describing, Emma, is like they do come in a very peaceful, loving way. And sometimes, which is so beautiful, they give you the gift mm. of a glimpse of what it's like on the other side which is so, I'm just getting chills now, just thinking yeah. about it, where it's like a glimpse of the profound love and freedom mm -hmm. that is on the other side. Mm -hmm. That is, it's just so amazing. Yeah. And they give you a little bit of that. Yes. As a gift almost when you're giving the message to their loved one. Mm -hmm. And it makes the work so worth it when they, 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 they do that, they give you that little gift. Um, and just to so be able to pass that, to give that message on, you know, it's, um, it's never anything that's being, making that person aware of, like something's gonna happen. It's just a remembrance of that person. And it's, yeah, or some jewelry that someone wanted to show them, you know, that they want them to wear. That's come through quite a lot as well. It's amazing. I think I find all of it so fascinating. And the deeper you go and the, the wider you start opening up, the more you receive. And that's when you feel that, wow, there's so much beyond who we are as humans. So yeah. It's so exciting. I remember when it started really, really opening up, uh, like much bigger, was when I started stepping into my 40s. And I had like experiences all through my life with this sort of like parent, I guess you could say paranormal or mediumship or psychopomp stuff. But it wasn't until 40 when I started to help people yeah. and work into it. And I remember the moment when I just started to accept it as normal and the immense like wave of peace that just rolled over me. And I felt like this is just normal. Like this is just absolutely fine. And yeah. because there was you. just a sense of relief, you know? Yeah. Because it's you, you're being true to yourself. And I think that's when it feels right is when you're being true to yourself, when you're trusting your intuition, you're going with what you feel and not worrying about what anybody else thinks. Exactly. And I've got to say, that stepping into this zone is very much like you're like a kid. It's like the feelings that you had have when you're a small child and you're just so open and trusting and like, you know, hey, like, how can I help you? You know, when you're a child and you, you're egoless, you don't have any agenda, you're just concerned and you're just like, are you okay? Yeah. I would love to, ha can I help you? Why are you crying? You know, it's just yeah, like, it's really special. And I remember in, you know, through my journey too, a big part of my teaching is, is it's not, it wasn't so much, you know, the death doula training of course helped. It's an amazing training and I would recommend it to anyone who feels drawn to working in these realms. Yeah. But my biggest teacher has been a plant because I'm a, I'm a hedge witch and I work closely with the plant world in terms of herb magic and plant medicines. And my biggest teacher with death has been ayahuasca, which is a very powerful uh, shamanic brew from the Amazon. And working with this plant medicine has been my biggest teacher around death. And she really showed me how to hold space for people when they're dying. And she, she showed me that you need to sit with them like you are a child and wow. be that child and you, you know let that child come forward when you're holding their hand mm -hmm. when you're when you're with them and speaking to them so that was really a big changing point because there's nothing you can say to a dying person 
or a dying person's family member that's going to make it okay that's going to take away like that's going to fix things like you yeah, as, a, as a death doula you're not there to fix things yeah. people are grieving they're going through the process this is the reality of the great transition mm -hmm. that we're all going to go through the only thing that you need to do as a death doula is to hold the space with love, compassion, and this childlike openness that's just there to just bring in the support in this very energetic and emo emotional way. And often there's no words exchanged. Yeah. It's an energy, it's an energy. And so, you know, this wonderful plant medicine showed me how to do that. And, uh, you know, I always conjure that up when I'm sitting yeah. with a person or even when I'm doing mediumship stuff or psychopomp work and I'm clearing out a person's house and there's, there's, you know, there's people still yeah. there. There's like yeah. deceased people. I round them up like I'm a little kid, you know, like, Hey, it's okay. How are you? Know, I'm... Uh, do you? Yeah. Well, and then you ask them to, to leave, to go to the other side or what do you do? Well, I just, I just connect, I connect them to their ancestors. So part of it is, um, is, uh, you know, um, creating a portal, uh, yeah. allowing that opening and just allowing for this bridge so that they, they, their ancestors are there called through and then they're able to re reunite and go through the portal um, to reach their ancestors. But, you know, finding them in the house and gathering them and, you know, doing all the ritual process, uh, it, it, it just, you go into almost like this childlike state and yes. how... Of course, there's a lot of different herbs and plants that are helpful in working with that. Um, yeah. A lot of burning of resins, uh, particularly myrrh and rosemary. And but it's like this. Um, yeah, you know, it's not like they you, they say it in the show you in the movies where it's all like super serious and it's like you know the Exorcist. You know? Yeah, <laughs> it's exactly. Like, it's all like yeah, that's what you super, think it's gonna be. Yeah, it's wow. so. Not like that. It's 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 very childlike. It's very open and loving. Yes. Um, it's yeah. very. Yeah. <laughs> there's a humor to it as well. Like it's it's there's this lightness. It's, it's not heavy, you know. It's yeah, not definitely. This... No, that's the thing. When you feel it, it's, it's it is. It's you can't explain the energy. It's um, yeah. I know exactly. I know exactly what you mean. I'd love. I'd love to find out even more about it. So I'd have to get the name of the course that you did, Tree, as well. To yes, it's a very good because work. it is. Yeah. The the more the more I work, the more spirit comes through. The more you know. I, I work with people in hospices as well. I go to a hospice where um, there's cancer patients about to pass over, and just giving them the energy healing, allowing the space to be held for them to move forward on their journey is just yeah it's amazing it's a beautiful thing to be able to do for people i think it is and i think reiki is really wonderful for people end of life um, yes it's uh it's 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 really quite important people when they're end of life they you know they they have a lot of support when it comes to pain control we've really sorted that out you know in palliative care everyone has their the right doses to keep them comfortable as they're dying but there's no support for the psychological and emotional terrain no. that people go through or the spiritual trend terrain it's like a really really lacking you know and people have ego deaths and it's very difficult for them because they're dying and they think, what was I? What, who am I? What was this all about? And they want the support, the, these conversations. And there's almost like an, a, an energetic clearing that needs to happen. And I think Reiki is a wonderful, yeah. uh, wonderful healing tool for support for people going through a lot of that. It so, is. And I think the removing so of the fear, you know, there's a lot of fear, which rightly so. And if people don't want to leave, People don't want to go, you know, especially with cancer. They don't, they don't want to go. It's not their time. That's, that's hard. Really There's hard. a lot of fear. And, and often sometimes I see with, um, with death where the, the dying person is ready to go. They're ready to go. They're mm -hmm. like, here I go. But the family members aren't ready. And so yes, the energy of the family members keeps them tethered. You know, I've, 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 I've yeah. supported uh, clients before where there was unfinished business. 
And, mm -hmm. this is, and, and, you know, and the unfinished business needed to happen, like some forgiveness on the part of the family member and a letting go. And as soon as that happened, and it guided them through meditation and through that a bit of conversation, easy. and they were willing to let their, their, their loved one, their dad go, or their grandmother or their mother go, then within the hour, they pass because of yeah. that. Because they released. Yeah, the release is released. So it's incredible what Beautiful. happens. We, we can keep people tethered sometimes. And, uh, you know, there's also this, the classic thing too, when the dying person is, you know, ready to go, often they'll, they'll transist when the family member leaves the room. Yes. Like, yeah. you know, <laughs> it's like the wait until yeah, they're free now. The family member goes to use the, the, the bathroom and then they transist. So it's like they, <laughs> it's like really that's yeah of... that's their time to go it's amazing isn't it so that just shows you the power of energy that you know we all have this kind of magnetic hold you know oh, you can even see it and it's so powerful There's... in moments like that but it's there isn't it the energy around death is so high vibration it's mm -hmm. it's crazy you can feel it in the room all the, the times where i've had someone die and my, like the one time that man died in my arms in public, even the, the, the shift of energy is so high vibration. It is like unbelievable. Um, you can feel it. It's tangible. Um, you can, people feel high from it. In yes. fact, yeah. some of the case studies that I have, cause I'm currently studying transpersonal psychology uh, with altered states and psychedelics. And some of the case studies I talked to, people who've been around deathbeds of their loved ones have felt high, literally like psychedelic high uh, for days after the death. Wow. And so death is a psychedelic experience. It yeah. can really have, uh, it's a very palpable energy uh, of so many stories in and around that, including one, um, you know, uh, I'm a volunteer at St. Joseph's hospice. And I remember years ago, when we were taken around on the tour of the building and we were taken mm -hmm. into this you know one room a very nondescript room with no furniture nothing very just nothing kind of room no one's in there mm -hmm. as soon as we walked into this room i my breath like <gasps> literally took away and i just felt like the, the high vibration of this room and it was really tangible and i just said to the person guiding us just before they even said what the room was i was like what is this room <laughs> he just blurted yeah. it out and he said this is the room where they bring the bodies after the person's passed Whoa. in order for the family to come and have you know a, a sacred like you know grieving time with the body before it's sent to sent away to the aftercare mm -hmm. so we were literally in the room where you oh know people were paying yeah. their respects and I could really feel it. Yeah. It was just so mm. tangible. So the, it is a very high vibrational time. In fact, uh, there's like, you know, a saying in like the, the death doula scene and the psychopomp scene, there, especially in Ireland and the Celtic tradition, there are some people who are vampires, energy vampires yes, that yes. do come around at the time of death just to feed off just of that feed vibe. energy. Oh my goodness. I know it sounds mad, but it happens. Yeah, and totally. Gosh. Just 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 to feed off the uh, yeah. off that energy. Well, you, can, I know it's, well, you know, you know yourself when the spirit when spirit wants to connect with you. Like I go cold, freezing cold and the energy is just so intense. It's like, whoa, okay, here we go. <laughs> you know, so um I'm really conscious of time tree and thank you Claire for pointing that out because if anyone wants to ask some questions, please do. Um, I could talk to you all day. It's you're just so fascinating. It's been amazing, Tree. Thank you. Um, so yeah, feel free. Anybody who's there who wants to ask any questions, and should we pull a card? Should we pull a tarot card? We yeah, let's pull a tarot card. I've got yeah. my cards for some guidance as a Samhain tarot. Yeah. So we're on the very liminal day today, sacred day of our ancestors and loved ones, and so I'll pull a card. Yeah, let's see. All right, let's feel into them. Oh, 
while you do that, I'll just send some healing to the group. Okay. Good. Oh, we got a nine of uh, knight of swords, which is a nice card of encouragement for change, swift change, and energy moving very, very quickly and swiftly. And it feels very encouraging, especially under this aspect of Samhain today. So, any of you mm -hmm. listening who really felt like they wanted to shift into a deeper understanding of this. Of, of, of your connection to death and to the other side. This is encouraging card to say that th th this connection is moving quickly and that this energy is moving very quickly. So this is a really great time to allow yourself to connect to this energy, especially if you feel blocked in any kind of way. Swift change with the Knight of Swords, very swift change. Um, especially in the thinking realms too, because the swords are connected to the realms of thought. So it's not your mind changing through the process of this amazing uh, shift of energy and it can be quite profound. And I'm gonna pull another one, Emma. Mm, okay, like, like so nice... Claire's just asking, she's saying, I wanted to ask about remote work with guiding spirits in houses to ease them on their way. Yeah, cool. I'll answer that. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Let's pull a car, uh, final card. Yeah, and let's do another one. Okay. And for some of you who are interested in this line of work, the Eight of Pentacles, it's the card of apprenticeship. Um, and it's a card of, of a hard work and mastery. So any of you is sitting on the threshold of wondering if that's what you feel like you're pulled into, the card is really like encouraging you to, you know, to go for it. So part of it now is the time. Yeah, now's the time. Put, put the work in, you know, maybe it's a course, maybe it's an apprenticeship or a mentorship of some kind. Um, and yeah, uh, the more you work at this, the more you move into the the mastery of it. Uh, so don't be afraid of it. Allow yourself to trust and just pull in the direction where you feel that you're being called and pulled into going. So I'm going to answer that question mm. about the, the remote. Uh, so yes, you can work remotely. Um, if you have a client uh, or someone who said, I feel like I've got um, a presence in my house. Uh, mm. It feels like there's something there. You can set intentions to connect to this through meditations at home. Um, uh, also um, through remote viewing, which is um, the practice of being able to see into the space remotely. And it takes a little bit of practice to do that, uh, but the more, you, the more you connect to meditation, the easier it, it is. <clears throat> and a good time to do it as well is on the threshold of sleep to the, it's called the hypnagogic state yeah so on the threshold of sleep you can you can remote view also the hypnopompic state which is just as you're waking up if you set your intentions <clears throat> to connect you can do that as well um also dreams uh setting intentions to connect to the space and to the deceased person through the dream state mm -hmm. uh through out-of-body experiences so astral astral states astral projection yeah. and so those are the realms in where i've been able to do clearings um uh remotely because i was saying that i had one uh one experience where they scare you and it gets your attention so i did a clearing for uh someone's apartment in new york city once remotely they, they were yeah remotely through the dream state and uh, with intention and uh, I woke up in the middle of the night like in the hypnagogic state yeah like in sleep paralysis and this wo this woman uh, came out of the darkness and she came right into my face making pig sounds like going <laughs> like really quick in my face yeah getting your attention got wow. my attention it jolted awake and I was like Fuck! <laughs> and I was like okay hi you got my attention we're going to connect. Okay. And, um, so, you know, of course 
you know, it was startled me, but then I, I was like, okay, we made contact. So I went back in and then I was able to, I, she was in my dreams all night and I, they were, some of them were lucid, some of them were astral and I guided her uh, back to her, to her mom. And it was interesting because she started off as scaring me, but then in the dream, dream state, I saw that, oh, she was confused. She was, she had died inebriated, drunk. She was like, wow. um, didn't know she was dead. Uh, there was moments where I was talking to her on the phone in the dream. There was other moments where she turned into a little girl and I was connecting her to her mother. So um, that's how you can do it remotely. Uh, so if you are a dream worker, it really helps if yeah. you're able to go into lucid dreaming states uh, or out of body states. But there's lots of information out there, including in my books. Yes, yeah, you like your conscious dreamer. Is yeah. it in your conscious dreamer book tree? Is that the latest one? Yeah, the latest one is conscious dreamer. This mm. one here, which okay. is uh, helps you to get into dream work yeah, over amazing. 30 days of um practicing connecting to your dreams or you could grab my first book which um yeah is a good precursor as well just to get the practice going that's great and i think cyber polk was saying what considered a great work for death doula maintaining serenity i guess what's considered a great work for death doula maintaining serenity yeah, as a death doula, you need to have a lot of self-care mm. and, uh, and practices that keep you calm and not sponging in everybody's grief. You, understanding mm. boundaries and healthy energetic boundaries, healthy emotional and psychological boundaries is very important as yeah. well. And having your own self-care practices that can keep you, you know, nurtured and you know, strong within the realms of bereavement and grief are, are really important. And so that's a really great part of the practice mm -hmm. too, is that you have, you have to take care of yourself. Yeah, and... absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Because I mean, you know, it's powerful work that we do. So it's, um, you have to. Yes. Tree, thank you so much. Thank you. It's been I'm sorry I talked so much. I know we have, haven't we? <laughs> we carry on. But, um, you know, so Tree, you're doing is mm. it a workshop tonight as well. So if anyone wants to join that, that's it. She's lost control. And you've got um, Tree's link here. So just go on her Instagram page and you can find out all the details as well. And anything else you want to share, Tree? Anything else that you, any workshops you've got coming up? I know we're going to talk about doing something as well soon, hopefully in Kent. So that'll be exciting. Yes, well, I'll come to uh, Tunbridge Wells and we'll do something yeah. in real That'll be amazing. Yeah. And uh, tonight is Samhain. So if you want to join in on a ceremony or a ritual at 8.30 tonight, just check out my uh, um, my link on my page. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of things on my page, lots of things coming up, including a new book I'm, I'm working on, on the tarot as well. Mm. Amazing. Thank you so much, Tree. So just to finish, we'll just send a healing to the group just to thank everyone for being here and joining us today. It's been great to have so many of you connecting and hope it's inspired you to make that transition in your life too. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Tree. Thank you so much, Emma. Have an it amazing evening to tonight. And you. And, and to everybody. everybody. Yeah, and I'll speak to you soon. Speak soon. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>